multiple fields of activity who shaped and guided not only the creation of the United States, but for the United States to become the greatest republic that ever existed in human history. A few weeks ago, Lady Rubenstein did a presentation on General Douglas MacArthur. Tonight, we're going to get to know James Fenimore Cooper. In a recent paper by LaRouche called Mankind's Existence is Called into Question, next, he writes, any truly great discovery of principle is distinguished by the fact that it never continues as a fixed object, but rather exists as a seminal element of the actual in-progress motion of a future of mankind. A future proceeding from lo relatively lower origins of achievements to those masterpieces which, like seeds, have been transformed into a fruit of immortality in the outcome of the present as also the future. Such persons as those are true immortals. Those great Americans who created this republic, who carried out the revolution, who wrote the U.S. Constitution, fulfill LaRouche's criteria for immortality. And our purpose as human beings today must in fact be not to betray those great men and women who created all that we have today, but to live our lives just as they did, for such a purpose as they did. Now, James Fenwar Cooper is best known today, if known at all, as the author of the Leatherstocking Tales of Frontier Novels. Five of them, in fact, which follow a single character from the period before the American Revolution to sometime after the American Revolution. The most well known of the five is The Last of Mohicans. Anybody read The Last of Mohicans? Okay, there's a few people. Okay. That book has been made into movies numerous times by Hollywood. And in fact, in the 1950s, there was a weekly Last of the Mohicans series on television. The last movie made called The Last of the Mohicans was 1992. And at that time, I wrote a review of that movie, and I demanded that the producer of that movie be arrested for crimes <laughs> of <laughs> So, <laughs> Cooper was born in 1789, the year the U.S. Constitution was ratified. He died in 1851, 62 years spanning the beginning of our Constitutional Republic, through the War of 1812, through the tremendous economic development represented by the John Quincy Adams presidency in the 1820s, to the destruction of the American system of economics by the presidency of jo uh, Andrew Jackson, up until that period which really has to be considered the eve of the Civil War. 62 years metaphorically reflected in the opening sentence of British author Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities, a novel of the French Revolution. Dickens, you may be familiar with, wrote The Christmas Carol, Oliver Twist, and Great Expectations. So Dickens wrote, this is the opening sentence, of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, 
It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. So that's the opening sentence of A Tale of Two Cities, written in 1859. Was that original with him? To create an extended contrast of opposite, opposites, which like a Shakespearean chorus for a tragedy, takes the reader's minds out of the immediacy of now and places them in history. Was that original with Dickens? Yes and no. <laughs> like Beethoven, who would take a theme from Mozart and develop it, repeat it, develop it, and modify it, bringing a new creation into being. That's what Dickens did. Here's James Fenwick Cooper introduction to the Heidemauer. There's a spelling up there. Actually, there's supposed to be an E right before the R. Again. Right. Written in 1832, 27 years before the appearance of A Tale of Two Cities. So be patient. It's a little bit. It's one sentence. <laughs> For a time, we quitted Paris. You know, Cooper was in Europe for seven years. This was written in 1832, the year before he came back to the United States. So he writes, For a time we quitted Paris, the queen of modern cities, with its tumults and its order, its palaces and its lanes, its elegance and its filth, its restless inhabitants and its stationary politicians, its theories and its practices, its riches and its poverty, its gay and its sorrowful, its rentiers and its patriots, its young liberals and old illiberals, its three estates and its equality, its delicacy of speech and its strength of conduct, its governments of the people and its people of no governments, its bayonets and its moral force, its science and its ignorance, its amusements and its revolutions, its resistance that goes backward, and its movement that stands still, its milliners, its philosophers, its opera dancers, its poets, its fiddlers, its bankers, and its cooks. Although Saul so long enthralled within the barriers, it was not easy to quit Paris entirely without regret. Paris, which every stranger censures and every stranger seeks, which moralists abhor and imitate, which causes the heads of the old to shake and the hearts of the young to beat. Paris, the center of so much that is excellent and of so much that cannot be named. Okay. So, now another element, you know, Dickens and Cooper again. Cooper's novel, Home is Found, written in the about 1834, 35, includes a very slimy, dishonest, manipulating character named Steadfast Dodge. 
Okay. <laughs> Dickens, 30 years later, in Oliver Twist, has a similar slimy, dishonest, manipulative character named Artful Dodger. Okay. First Steadfast Dodge, and then Artful Dodger. That cannot be a coincidence. Though we actually may appreciate Cooper's name a little more for its inherent uh, quality of paradox. Right? Steadfast dodge. <laughs> anyway, Cooper, an author of 32 novels, hundreds of articles, thousands of letters, and fundamentally important work of historical research, like his history of the U.S. Navy. Cooper put the United States on the map of being an intellectual power in this world. He created the modern form of the novel. He created the frontier adventure story, the sea novel, the sea story, he created revolutionary adventure stories with the spy, for example. He created fiction writing itself in the United States, which could become an actual occupation for American writers. Herman Melville, Melville the author of Moby Dick, said his work would not have been possible without the 15 sea adventure novels that Cooper had written. Mark Twain, Edgar Allan Poe, the Russian writers Tolstoy, Pushkin, all wrote in the footsteps of Cooper. Victor Hugo, the French author of Les Miserables, wrote that Cooper, outside of France, was the greatest author in the world of the 19th century. He put the United States on the map for beginning an actual intellectual, cultural renaissance that would go along with the power of the Republican form of government that had been created. In Germany, between 1815 and 1824, Sir Walter Scott, a British spy, feudalism worshiping degenerate <laughs> was the dominating intellectual influence in Germany in that period, as he was in the United States in that period. But by 1824, just four years after Cooper began writing his novels and published and the spy was published in Germany, 1824, Scott was quickly pushed aside. And not only in Germany, in fact, Cooper became in just a few years, during the 1820s, the most widely read author in the world. His works were translated into French, German, Italian, Spanish, Russian, Polish, Hungarian, even Persian. Clearly, as he had forecast, the world was thirsting for American literature and ideas. Of Cooper, the Paris Glove wrote in 1827, quote, Cooper portrays solitary heroes who exercise the height of human virtues and human potentialities. He shows us the promise of a new civilization in which laws are the guarantees of human liberty. In the pages of Cooper, we see the political revolution which made such a society possible, and we witness the progress of settlements which are bringing it to fruition. Unlike Walter Scott, who hides his lack of principle behind a ruse of objectivity. Cooper proclaims his faith in liberty, country, and the dignity of human nature. Cooper represents for the European reader 
the very type of noble American Republican. In Germany, more than a hundred editions of his most well-known novels were published between 1826 and 1914. What's 1914? Ah. World War I. Right? Cooper was determined to use art to uplift humanity so that mankind would be equipped to create an age of reason so that the young United States could once and for all cease being intellectually dependent on the degenerate monarchies, oligarchies, and aristocracies of Europe. He understood the importance of diffusing classical culture in the young United States. He conceived of fictional works as, quote, formidable weapons in the cause of morality. And he was determined to, quote, rouse the sleeping talents of the nation. During the seven years in Europe, while in France, the constant companion of Cooper was Samuel Morris. Anyone know Samuel Morris? Morris Cove. Yeah. <laughs> right? Morris Cove, the inventor of the telegraph. But before he developed the telegraph, he was a competent classical painter and portraitist. Collaborating and collaborating with Cooper in the Louvre in Paris, Morris produced this painting called the Gallery of the Louvre. Very large painting. You know, it's like eight feet across or more, eight or ten feet across. And what Morris does is he brings into one gallery the greatest works of the greatest artists you know, from the Renaissance onward. Right? Now the idea that Cooper and Morris had was to finish this and then take it to the United States and have it travel around and in that way, because you know, this is before photography existed. Okay? So how you can give Americans a real taste of what a great classical work of art looks like. You know? So this was their idea. Now it didn't work out so well. And <laughs> I'll just point out, uh, within the painting itself, right there, is Cooper, his daughter, and his wife. Right? So Morris brought them into the painting itself. OK. So anyway, so. Cooper was working on multiple fronts. This isn't the only one. He personally financed young American artists studying in Europe, like the sculptor Horatio Greenow, whose bust and statue of George Washington you can see in Washington, D.C. today. Because of, Green, of Cooper's support, Greenow became really the first recognized American sculptor in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. And there's Greenow with his bust of George Washington. That's, and here's Greenow's bust of Cooper himself. Now, Cooper's Not a very good picture, but anyway. Okay. Cooper's friends included the painters Thomas Cole and John Chapman. Here's Cole's The Course of Empire, a five part series painted between 1833 and 1836. Cole, like Cooper, was warning Americans of their fate should they allow their nation to imitate the empires of Europe. Now this five part series, the first is the savage states, called the course of empire. Right? 
So the wilderness. Right? I'm not going to go through in detail on this. You know, don't have time right now. But number two is a pastoral state, the beginnings of civilization. Actually, you can see in the background actual buildings at that point. Aren't they next one? Number eight. Okay. This is the consummation of empire. The empire at its peak. And then the empire's destruction. And a return to desolation. So, Cooper had written in his book called Notions of the Americans, uh, printed and published 1828-29, he had written that the practical cares of life had held back artistic development in America. Yet the talent is there, he said. It wants training and a push to bring it forth. Later in the book, he writes, the purely intellectual day of America is yet in its dawn. His optimism and faith in creating an American Renaissance, Renaissance was explicit. He said, we live in the excitement of a rapid and constantly progressing condition. The impetus of society is imparted to all its members, and we advance because we are not accustomed to stand still. Further, he, told, he wrote, our prosperity is owing to our intelligence, and our intelligence to our institutions. Every discreet man in America is impressed with the importance of diffusing instruction among our people. And the concluding part of that book, he says, you know, you get the sense of the optimism, right? A new era is now about to dawn on this nation. It has ceased to creep. It begins to walk erect among the powers of the earth. All these things have occurred within the life of a single man. Europeans may be reluctant to admit the claims of a competitor that they knew so lately as a pillaged, a wronged, and a feeble people. But nature will have her laws obeyed, and the fulfillment of things must come. The spirit of greatness is in this nation. Its means are within its grasp. And it is as vain as it is weak to attempt to deny results that every year is rendering more plain, more and more irresistible. Oh, hello. You're late. <laughs> My son's mom was late. <laughs> okay. All right. So, this is a presentation on James Fenler Cooper. You familiar with him? I've heard the name. The writer. Yeah. Okay. Lost in the Mohicans. Right. Okay. Is that right, Badger Courage, also? No, that's the Minnesota Canadian. Lost in the Mohicans. I'm Mohawk Indian, so that could, that's good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. All right. So, you missed the introduction, but you know, what Cooper's doing is he's deliberately creating a renaissance in the United States to uplift the intellectual quality of the American population so the Americans will quit being subservient to European oligarchical aristocracy views, views and opinions. Right? I went through a bunch of this in the, in the work, right? in literature, in art, in sculpture, and he's in the middle of all of it. You know? So this is up to the period of 1824, 28, Period, period. Now, but it was not just literature and art that Cooper helped to shape in this country. In his introduction to the 
history of New York, which was he was writing when he died in 1851, therefore only the introduction was actually completed. He discusses why the idea of secession, this is 1851, right, 10 years before the Civil War, right, why the idea of secession of the southern states because of slavery was absolutely unconstitutional. His arguments, which he develops at length there, were the same arguments that were presented 10 years later by Abraham Lincoln in his inaugural address. Lincoln, when very young, had read the Leatherstocking Tales, which, according to one biographer of Lincoln, thrilled him to no end. Cooper died 160 years ago, and I think the appropriate epitaph with which I think you will hopefully agree by the end of this evening, is the following from our British enemies. They said, Cooper was a man who had constituted himself the literary antagonist of the monarchy, aristocracy, and feudality of all Europe, and particularly England. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Number 10. At the end of the revolution, with American independence secured from the British Empire, you know, a lot of Americans don't know who we fought a revolution against. Yep. The British Empire. You know, a group of American military officers created the Society of the Cincinnati, an institution to protect and promote that victory against the British Empire, but also to replicate its achievements on a world scale. Francis Mar Francis Marquis de Lafayette, do people familiar with Lafayette's role in the American Revolution? General, he's a general, right? Okay. Right. He founded the European branch of the society along with especially some Republican and Polish officers who had come over and fought in the revolution. <coughs> and they created a network which 40 years later, James Fenimore Cooper would become a central figure. Membership in the society was limited to the military officers but it was also hereditary. That is, the sons of these officers would become members. And it was the sons of these officers and others, such as Cooper, John Quincy Adams, and a few others, who would lead and protect the nation during the first half of the 19th century. This was the second generation of the American Revolution in action. In the decades following the adoption of the Constitution, the quality and mind, the intellectual level of the leaders of the United States, in contrast to the intellectual giants who created the nation, wrote the Constitution, and created the American system, but with very few exceptions, the political leaders each decade deteriorated. And the in nation increasingly sank into mediocrity and then lower into downright evil with the ascension into the presidency of Andrew Jackson in 1829. Recognizing and determining to reverse this trend, James Fenimore Cooper took up his pen to defend the nation by waging war on the British Empire and its key allies, stupidity, <laughs> ignorance, treachery, and cowardice. Those are the key allies of any empire. A central figure 
in the attempt by the British after about 1890, right after the, the Constitution was ratified, was Aaron Burr. <coughs> Even before he murdered Hamilton in 1804, Burr was working for the British. As a prominent New York lawyer at the time, he was appointed general, but uh, he was appointed state attorney general in 1790, and shortly thereafter made the state land commissioner. And in 1791, he was appointed as U.S. Senator. So he's holding three offices simultaneously, right? You know, Attorney General of the State of New York, Land Commissioner of the State of New York, and U.S. Senator. So from these positions, Burr then went to work for the British land speculators in Upper New York State, right, who were buying up millions of acres of, of land on the border of the British colony called Canada, right, an inroad into the country as part of a broad strategic uh, assault and plan to reconquer the United States. It was illegal for foreigners to own land in New York State at the time. But look who was the land commissioner, look who was the attorney general, and look who was the lawyer for the British land companies, Aaron Burr, all three, you know, in addition to U.S. Senate. This British agent, Burr, almost became president of the United States. In the 1800 election, it was only Alexander Hamilton's tie-breaking vote in the Congress that put Jefferson into the presidency instead of Burr, but Burr became vice president. In, now, he's vice president of the United States, 1804. While he's the vice president of the United States, he murders Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> and in the days following his murder, which was July 11th, 1804, Burr fled to his British friends. And the result of his discussions with the British was the following letter sent by the British ambassador, Anthony Mary, to his home office in London, dated August 4th, less than one month after he murdered Hamilton. It reads, I have just received an offer from Mr. Burr, the actual Vice President of the United States, to lend his assistance to His Majesty's government in any manner in which they may think fit to employ him particularly endeavoring to effect a separation of the western part of the United States from that which lies between the Atlantic and the mountains in its whole extent. This proposition on this and other subjects will be fully detailed to your lordship by Colonel Williamson, who has been the bearer of them to me and who will embark for England in a few days. No. Now, is that treason? <laughs> no. No. Okay. Burr was under indictment in New Jersey for the murder of Hamilton, but he's the vice president. He's immune from prosecution. Right? So, he's going further. He plans out and carries out actions to effect what he, what the, what's said in the letter, the split up and separation of the United States. Right? So this continued, and it became so blatant that even the wimpish Thomas, President Thomas Jefferson finally had to have Burr arrested for treason, and he's put on trial. Now, Burr had drawn Andrew Jackson into the conspiracy to bust up the United States. And it was Jackson, Jackson wasn't indicted though, but Jackson was at Burr's trial 
and he helped manipulate the jury into finding Burr innocent. <laughs> well, Burr returned the favor to Jackson by making him president in 1828. That was Burr behind that. Finally, Burr fled to Britain in 1808, a hated and hunted man who mobs of patriots wanted to lynch. This is where James Fenwar Cooper enters our story. His father, William Cooper, a friend of Washington, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, had moved his family into the same general area of New York State that Burr's clients had been buying up in the 1780s and 90s, when young James was merely one year old. John Jay's sons, Peter and William, would become lifelong friends and political collaborators of young and then older James Fenimore Cooper. William Cooper created a prosperous settlement which became known, and is still known today, as Cooperstown, New York. Anyone else know what else Cooperstown is famous for? So William Cooper served as a judge two terms in the U.S. Congress, a political leader of the state, especially upstate New York, and he created a viable civilization out of a wilderness. The British land speculators, whom Burr worked for and represented, for years attempted to steal the Coopers' land holdings, including their own home in Cooperstown and most of Cooperstown. Right? Now, as we reported, the British land companies were represented by Aaron Burr. William Cooper's lawyer was Alexander Hamilton. William Cooper died in 1809. Now, in the early years, the early 1800s, the French and the British were at war with each other. The United States was maintaining its neutrality, but the British didn't goddamn give a damn. Okay? So what did they do? You know, any American ship that attempted to go to France for trading, you know, a neutral ship, okay, the British would board. And in fact, hundreds of ships were seized and kept by the British. American ships in this period of, of you know, about 1800 to 1810 or so. Right? Now, the, uh, this outrage went on until finally, in 1812, the U.S. declared war, America's second war of independence, the War of 1812. The most outrageous element of this British piracy was the kidnapping of American sailors. Okay? The British Navy would stop U.S. ships and search them for any sailor who they could claim was a British citizen, a former British citizen, or a resident at any time in their lives of a British colony. Now that pretty well covers the world outside the United States. <laughs> now, so whether or not this individual sailor had become American citizen didn't matter. You know? Any such found on U.S. ships was then impress, impressed into the British Navy. And of course this caused even further outrage, but the weak need Jefferson administration merely made impotent diplomatic protests. Now this is the surrounding environment in which the young James Fenimore Cooper came of age. And of course for him all this was personal. Not only was he 15 years old when Burr murdered Hamilton, that is his father's lawyer, 
And, of course, young James was well aware of the British attempts to steal the Cooper land holdings. And he got, you know, after his, death, his father's death in 1809, it was not for another dozen years before the final attempts by these land companies to steal the Cooper lands was finally defeated. At the age of 17, you know, uh, Cooper went to sea, shipping out on a merchant vessel where he learned not only seamanship, which of course becomes the basis of his 15 novels of sea adventures, right? but most importantly he learned in person the nature of the British Empire. During his two years on a merchant ship, his ship was stopped four times by the British Navy and personal friends on board were impressed into the British Navy. And in most cases, you know, these men were never heard from again. They lived and they died in the British Navy. And in fact, his best friend, when they were on shore in London, was kidnapped by one of these impressive gangs. As Matthew Carey documents in his Olive Branch, the key issue that drove the United States to declare war on Britain in 1812 was the impressment of somewhere between five and 20,000 American sailors wow. into the British Navy. And of course also the British attacks on US ships, including US Navy ships. And Cooper then joined the Navy in 1808, though he resigned in 1811, somewhat as a condition of his future father-in-law for the marriage to his daughter. The friends he made in the Navy would become lifelong friends, and his loyalty to the Navy and his love of the sea would be expressed in his sea stories, his history of the U.S. Navy, and his lives of American naval officers and other writings. Now, since the Federalist Party of New England, now at that time you had the Democratic Republican Party, or it became the Democratic Party, the Jefferson was part of it, and you had the Federalist Party, which is a mixed bag like the Republican Party today. Right? You had patriots and, and good people, and you had a bunch of British agents and idiots, you know, just like the Republican Party today. You know? The Democratic Party was somewhat like the Democratic Party today. You know, you know dumb. You know, uh, I think that's the best way to characterize it. You know, and cowardly, actually. Cowardly, I think, is very good, too. You know. Anyway, so since the Federalist Party in the early 1800s allied themselves with the British you know, and opposed every measure to counter the British naval operations against U.S. shipping and sailors. They opposed it. Uh, this caused Cooper to turn away from the Federalist Party of which his father you know, had been a congressman of. And he became a Democrat. The behavior of the Federalists in the War of 1812 you know, included the buying of British war bonds. You know, this is incredible, right? You know, you know, but this cemented Cooper's identity as a Democrat and his hatred for the Federalist Party. You know, I mean, his own friends have been you know, kidnapped by the damn British. You know, and this is where the paradox that we'll discuss a little later begins. Well, a Democrat, he detested virtually everything that Democratic president Andrew Jackson represented, you know, while at the same time expressing at least mild support for Jackson during Jackson's presidency. More important is that like John Quincy Adams,
Cooper was not a party man. And he condemned the party system as destructive of principle, destructive of individual character, and a fundamental threat to the American Republic. Now, the American resurgence in the world in the War of 1812 against the world's greatest military power, and essentially the war was fought to a draw, you know, this created a fertile ground for an aggressive U.S. intervention directly into Europe, which continued until 1832-33. The ideas generated by the American Revolution, by Friedrich Schiller in Germany, by the Stein-Humboldt reforms of education in Germany in the late 1809-1812 uh, well, period, the experience of the resistance of the German Republicans to the Napoleonic Wars in the 1813 and 1814 period. All this created an embedded Republican spirit deep in the German character population along with that of other nations. Now the Napoleonic Wars were settled by the Treaty of Vienna, 1815, which also then created the Holy Alliance, Austria, Prussia, Russia, uh, and Spain, an agreement of these monarchies or oligarchies with the British, like the British operation today, they're not in the Euro, but they control it, right? You know? Well, they control the Holy Alliance from the outside. Right? And, but the intention of the Holy Alliance you know, was to eradicate from the face of the planet the idea of representative Republican government and eradicate the American Republic itself before the American system eradicated them. Right? Now that, and that's explicit, right? While maintaining a ruthless suppression of Republican ideas, the Holy Alliance also launched an all-out assault on the cultural and intellectual traditions of the American Revolution and German classicism. This is where they brought Walter Scott and his degenerate feudalism worshiping novels in both the United States and Germany and just sold them for a penny in a book. You know? And these you know, Ivanhoe and, and these other books by Scott were essentially the equivalent of today's soap operas on television. <laughs> maybe a little more degenerate, maybe not sexually, but in mentally. Right? Now, in the United States now, Cooper took up his pen to defend the country. In 1820, he began writing novels. The first one was Precaution, which is an imitation British Walter Scott, you know, romantic novel. You know? Because Cooper said to his wife one day, he was looking at one of these novels, he said, I can do better than that. <laughs> and so he wrote one that was better than that. You know? And he kind of got addicted to writing. You know? And out comes his second one, you know, the the spy. And nobody had ever written, you know, a, uh, a spy intelligence, you know, undercover novel anywhere in the world, really. Right? And so the spy exploded across the United States and soon was published in Britain, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, you know, on, and onward into Russia. Right? It just exploded. The most popular book in the world of the 1820s. <laughs> And in that year of 1826, Cooper and his family packed up and left the United States and went to Europe and stayed there for seven years. You know? And it was in Europe that Cooper began closely working with the Marquis de Lafayette, 
who urged him in 1828 to write a book that later was called The Notions of the Americans. Now, this, published 1829, is a book, that a book of demonstration of American principles and, uh, and actions. You know, it, it was written in the form of a travel, a travel log, you know, of a British citizen who travels the United States and he's writing letters back to home describing everything he sees in the United States, except Cooper writes all the letters. Right? You know, and the outline of it is very interesting because essentially it's modeled upon the Federalist Papers of Hamilton, Jay, and Madison, you know, which is the most <laughs> profound document of Republican government ever written. And if you have not read the, the Federalist Papers, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself <laughs> if you call yourself an American. So, Cooper wrote in that book, he said, quote, the literature of the United States is a subject of the highest interest in the civilized world. For when it does begin to be felt, it will be with a force, a directiveness, and a common sense in its application that has never yet been known. If there were no other points of difference between this country and other nations, those of its political and religious freedom alone would give a color of the highest importance to the writings of a people so thoroughly imbued with their distinctive principles and so, and so keenly alive to their advantage. Cooper went on to write that for 50 years, America had been operating silently on Europe by force of example. But now had come the time where American authors, familiar with its doctrines and its experience, should press upon the world's attention its ideas with articulate expression. Books, he said, are in great measure the instruments of controlling the nation like ours. They are an engine alike powerful to save or destroy. Based in Paris with Lafayette, he coordinated the work of other Americans like Samuel Morris and Edgar Allan Poe. And Poe was a member of our earlier mentioned uh, Cincinnati Society of the Cincinnati. In 1824, you know, Cooper's still in the United States, John Quincy Adams had been elected president of the United States. During, president, during the presidential campaign, Lafayette had returned to the United States. Now this is all 48 years after the revolution, right? The Lafayette fought him, right? So in 1824, Lafayette returns to the United States. He makes a year-long tour of the U.S., just everywhere he goes, right? uh, And this helped ensure Adams' victory against Andrew Jackson, running as the Democrat. And Adams, who had always re rejected the party label idea, actually ran under no party and won the election. Now, the host for, John, for uh, Lafayette, when Lafayette was in New York City, was James Fenwick Cooper. And so that's when they first met. During 1827-1828, Lafayette's home was the headquarters of the European-wide Republican movement. And over the next couple of years, Cooper not only worked with Lafayette in coordinating revolutionary movements from Greece, Italy, Spain, Poland, Britain, the Netherlands, I mean, they, 
all these revolutionaries came to Paris, met with Lafayette, met with Cooper, and Cooper would send out agents into various countries, and we'll get a little bit more on that in a second. But during this time, Cooper did a serious study of the history of feudalism, monarchy, aristocracy, and he concluded uniquely at that time among all political commentators, so-called, but he concluded that actual monarchy in Europe was dead. Only a semblance of it remained. And what really dominated Europe was a financial oligarchy determined to maintain its power against the American-led Republican movement. It was this activity and study which led to Cooper's three novels based upon European themes and settings. His belief that fictional works were formidable weapons in the cause of morality was no better demonstrated than in the oligarchy's response to the first of these three novels, The Bravo. This book ripped away the popularized myth of the gentlemanly nature of such people, the oligarchs, that is. Cooper's insight into the irrational, lawless character of the oligarchical mind and his ability to vividly portray the struggle between the oligarchy and Republicans in the Bravo set off alarm bells in London and Paris. Cooper began writing the Bravo in 1830, shortly after a two-week stay in Venice. The title, hey, we've fallen behind us. The Bravo. <laughs> That's the cover of the Bravo, one, one of the covers, one of the editions. Yeah. I'll show you this, actually. I'd lost, you know, I had these uh, 1930 set of Cooper's, and I loaned out my copy of the Bravo to someone here. I can't remember who. You know, if it's one of you, let, you know, you give it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so, uh, a week or so ago, I, you know, I'm getting desperate. We're going to do this class here shortly. I needed a copy of the Bravo. You know? So I got on Amazon, and I found one for $2. You know? Here it is. <laughs> Published in 1835. Oh, wow. This book is 175 years old. Wow. That's amazing, huh? You want to lend that one out, <laughs> Okay, so the title, the Bravo, refers to a supposed spy, an assassin, in the employ of the Venetian ruling oligarchy. Okay. In this case, his name is Jacopo. Okay. And the time of the story is the early 1700s. It really is the beginning of the deterioration of the Venetian power in the world. But for a thousand years, Venice had been the center of evil in this world, where they planned wars, revolutions, overthrows, and they stole and enforced slavery and everything else on a wide uh, uh, expanse of the world itself. As LaRouche said, many, many, many years ago, he said, Venice was the worst cesspool in modern history. <laughs> and for centuries, of course, Venice looted the world. How, through a very highly refined system of manipulation supported by military force, internal order and stability in Venice was maintained by one of the most ruthless, cruel, cynical, and faceless systems 
ever devised by man. At the center of the Venetian power was the state inquisition. And Cooper describes it in the Bravo. He said, quote, thus there existed at all times in the heart of Venice a mysterious and despotic power that was wheeled by men who moved in society unknown and apparently surrounded by all the ordinary <coughs> cherries of life, but which, in truth, was influenced by a set of political maxims that were perhaps as ruthless, tyrannic, and as selfish as ever were invented by the evil ingenuity of man. Ten years after the death of Cooper, Cooper's daughter Susan, an author himself, wrote that when her father first discovered the internal workings of the Venetian political system, it filled him with horror and indignation. The system ex exuded the stench of the canals of Venice. The city of parasites was the former global center of the oligarchical financial and political power, but was losing its grip slowly during this period to the emergence of the <coughs> British Dutch imperial power. Now, two other great authors used Venice as the scene of the crimes they were reporting. Shakespeare wrote The Merchant of Venice and Othello, right? and Friedrich Schiller wrote The Ghost Seer, or The Apparitionist. And in The Apparitionist, Schiller you know, has a, a fascinating and puzzling, in a lot of ways, uh, presentation of how the Venetian system would corrupt decent, well-meaning people into its clutches and use them. Right? And that's the, that's the question of the Bravo in Cooper's novel. Right? The Bravo, a young man who is induced into becoming an agent of the oligarchical power of the Venetian you know, Council of Three, you know, to actually act like or gain the reputation that he's a murderer and a spy, right? when he isn't, right? for their other ends. And the way they got him to do this is they arrested his father and threw him in a dungeon. And they told him, if you do what we're telling you to do, we'll let your father out for one of these days, maybe, hopefully. You know, don't count on it too much, but maybe we will. Right? And so they sucked him into this. And uh, so the, the Bravo presents us with an amazing map of the thinking processes of the oligarchical mind. The sense of individual identity of an oligarch is entirely located in the social structure of the oligarchy itself. Universal principles, law, neither defines the individual self-conception, nor even any internally defined purpose. The oligarch is totally other-directed, a mere tool or appendage for maintaining the continuity of the oligarchical system itself. Thus, for the oligarch, since there is no universal or higher purpose in individual life. No obligation to <coughs> principles, no obligation to law, to justice, nothing, no matter how bestial or obscene, is forbidden. Of course, the individual oligarch should not embarrass the family with his lawless behavior. Thus, the masks of Venice 
disguise the perpetrators of evil while permitting and condoning the acts. Cooper considered the Bravo his best novel and the novel that best expressed the American idea. He followed up the Bravo with two more novels depicting the evil nature of the oligarchical system. One Heidenmauer and the other the headsman of Bern. The first depicted the German and the <coughs> oligarchical system, the second the Swiss. And the Heidenmauer will be our concluding section of our report tonight, which a short dialogue from the uh, novel itself will be read by Jeremy and Eric. Now, in Germany, because Cooper was in Italy and, and France and Germany, you know, he's all over the place, you know, Britain a couple of times in these seven years. But, you know, one thing I didn't read earlier was what Goethe said about Cooper. You know, you know he admired him, he loved him. You know, you know, he, Goethe wrote a short, uh, what was called the novel, novella, you know, a short novel. You know, it took him 30 years to, to write it. Right? But the entire sections were actually copied from Coop, Cooper's novel. Right? <laughs> you know, so, but, you know, Goethe really admired Cooper, obviously. But, you know, let's hear what Cooper has to say about Goethe. So, Cooper was in uh, Marbach, Germany, and it pointed out to him that here is the home of Friedrich Schiller. So Cooper's response is as follows. I do not remember a stronger conviction of the superiority enjoyed by true over factitious greatness than that which flashed on my mind when I was told the fact. The sequestered Hamlet rose in a moment to an importance that all the appliances and souvenirs of royalty could not give to the palace of Ludwigsburg or Schiller. In my eyes, he is the German genius of the age. Goethe has got around him one of those factitious reputations that depend on as much as unfortunate in being a coddled celebrity, for you must know there is a fashion in this thing that is quite independent of merit. <laughs> While Schiller's fame rests solely on its naked merits, my life for it, that it lasts the longest and will burn the brightest in the end. The schools, and a prevalent taste and the caprice of fashion can make Goethe's in dozens at any time. But God only creates such men as Schiller. So Cooper was in Germany in July of 1830 when a revolution in Paris broke out. What he'd been working to create for two years with Lafayette, right? A revolution. He arrived back in the city in August. The king, Charles X, had already been driven from the country. And Louis Philippe had been installed as the new king. Lafayette was the leader of the National Guard and the revolutionary forces generally. And he held you know, in his hands, the future of France. He recognized, Cooper recognized at once the horrendous mistake Lafayette had made in allowing Louise Philippe to become the new king. You know, rather than establishing an American model republic right on the spot. Cooper tried to salvage the situation, but it was too late. And by December, Lafayette was out. You know? And 
be, oligarchy had reestablished its power in France. In a letter, September 6th of 1830, to Peter Jay, Cooper reported on the lost opportunity. For a few days, the old veteran held the fate of France in his single hand. Cooper's letters to Peter Jay, U.S. Naval Commander William Shubrick, and a few others, written during this period, are fascinating. They are intelligence reports on the developments throughout Europe, the plans and activities of the enemies, what Cooper and his allies are doing, profiles of political leaders, and recommendations for actions by Americans to take to support the revolutionary movements in Europe itself. In one letter, Cooper writes, our agents complain there, as they do everywhere else, of the English influence being used against us. Of this fact, be assured, there is not a shadow of a doubt. As a nation, and often as individuals, they do us all the harm they can. The remainder of one of his letters that this was found in is a report on how Cooper had put together the evidence demonstrating without a doubt that the South Carolina secessionist crisis, then ongoing in the United States, was directed, supported, and uh, virtually created in London. Right? The secessionist crisis was 1828 to the early 1830s. South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union because of the high tariff that the U.S. Congress had imposed on imports which South Carolina said that wasn't fair to them, so we, we reject it and we're going to secede from the Union. Okay? So, you know, even Andrew Jackson was forced to tell him to sit down and shut up. You know? So, the, uh, in 1830, January 1832, <coughs> Cooper sent Dr. Samuel Grindley Howe to Poland to deliver money and intelligence to the Republican forces in Poland. Al was arrested, held for about a month, and then deported to France. Al, prior to this assignment, had spent about five years in Greece working with the revolutionaries there. And 30 years later, Al is the uh, uh, the chief medical officer in the Union Army during the Civil War, and his wife, Julia Ward Howe, is known to us today as the author of the Civil War anthem, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. So, by the spring of 1832, the Republican forces have been routed, virtually destroyed. And Cooper looked around in that fall and decided there was nothing more he could do in Europe, and he would head back to the United States. Serious problems were developing in the United States. When he left for Europe in 1826, John Quincy Adams was the president. Railroads and canals were being built all over the country, and John Quincy Adams had defeated the British attempt to seize the entire west coast of America as its colony. On his return, the British directed South Carolina secessionist crisis was reaching a climax. President Andrew Jackson was destroying the dirigist economic system of the country and refusing to defend the respect for American institutions abroad. The reports that Cooper had been getting in while in Europe described to him a degenerating state of society. So this is 1832. Jackson had been president for four years. You know? Arriving in the United States in 1833, after seven years in Europe, he was shocked 
at the deterioration of the institutions that had been created by his <coughs> father, by Washington, by Hamilton, Lafayette, and the others of the first generation of the American Revolution. Never one to be daunted by difficulties, Cooper went right to work in 1834, published a letter to his countrymen, in which he elaborated more deeply on the themes that he developed in Notions of the Americans in 1829. And his focus was, Americans have to quit being so damn slavish, slavishly dependent on European British opinions. Okay? The problem, especially, dominated U.S. newspapers. Beginning in 1828, the British and their American allies began to recognize in Cooper a very dangerous enemy to their empire and the oligarchical system in general. That year, Cooper had published The Notions of the Americans, which ripped into the slanders against the United States prevalent in Britain at that time. The Edinburgh Review thought the book demonstrated that Cooper was, quote, the most disagreeable personage we ever came across either in life or on paper, the knight errant of American optimism with his club for a lance and a mammoth or a seahorse for his charger. <laughs> then in 1831, he responded forcefully to a British-inspired attack published in France that had the theme that Monarchies are cheaper to run than republics. You know, Lafayette said, "You got to respond to this," and he did. And he devastated, you know, devastating attack. You know, demonstrated quite the opposite. You know, but that, you know, was another signal that, hey, we got a dangerous guy here. You know? And then the publishing of the Bravo later in 1831. You know, that did it. They declared war on Cooper. There's no, you know, there's no, you know, no way they can tolerate this guy even continuing to exist. I mean, that's what they're thinking, right? For example, the New York American reprinted an attack on the Bravo from the Parisian Journal de Debat. Cooper responded to this article in a letter to Samuel Morris. He said, the Bravo is certainly no very flattering picture of the upstart aristocrats of the new regimes. And nothing is more natural than their desire to undervalue the book. But the facility betrayed by our own journals in an affair of this nature is a source of deep mortification to every American. Reviews of his books from here on by especially British and American newspapers alive with the British. Actually, many American newspapers actually owned by British citizens, in fact, were vicious. Typical was the following review of his novel called The Monicans. Quote, it is a mass, a mass of husk and garbage and has disgraced the country. Then a review of a review, written by <laughs> Sir Walter Scott's son-in-law, read, guy's name was Lockhart. Lockhart showed potent causticity in exposing the gangrene of Cooper's mind in its most foul and diseased state. <laughs> 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 Name calling was not enough. You know? He was lied about, misquoted, distorted. His views were falsified by one journal after another. And Cooper counterattacked with a series of libel suits 
The libel law in the United States then was you had to prove that what they said about you was a lie, and they lost. You know? Not today. You, know? you can't win a libel suit in the U.S. today. So he'd win. Uh, these libel, libel suits, one after another, there were 18 of them total, something like that. Right? He won most of them. Right? But his approach to this battle, which was referred to at the time as Cooper's War Against the Press, was, in Cooper's words, so far as my means allow, insult shall be avenged by law, violence repelled by a strong hand, falsehood put to shame by truth, and sophistry exposed by reason. Cooper's comments on the newspapers of the time are as applicable today, today's media, as they were then. Quote, as the press of this country now exists, it would seem to be expressly devised by the great agent of mischief to depress and destroy all that is good and to elevate and advance all that is evil in the nation. Another one. Newspaper men are the funguses of letters who flourish on the dunghill of the common mind. <laughs> I have a better voice to it. The press is equally capable of being made the instrument of elevating man to the highest point of which his faculties admit, or of depressing him to the lowest. Now, as mentioned earlier, Cooper was a Democrat all his life. Yet he was horrified by what Andrew Jackson's administration had brought to the country. It had unleashed on the nation a partisanship and an irrational mob, a bought and paid for media that was you know, media of the political party. Because he was horrified, and because he would not stand by and watch his nation be destroyed, Cooper declared war on Andrew Jackson. But, remember, he's a Democrat. So he never identifies Jackson by name as the problem, right? you know, as the driver of the degeneration. Instead, he went after the mentality of the mob, and especially the newspapers, that fed that mentality. While in the assertion that my, you know, that Cooper, on my, well on the surface, my assertion that Cooper, who at least mildly defended Jackson during Jackson's presidency in the, in the 1830s, Cooper was also on a war path against virtually everything Jackson stood for. Now that may seem contradictory, but the appearance that underlines the complexity you know, of who Cooper really was you know, is not something simple or simplistic. You know? Now, the attacks on Cooper mainly came from the Whig press, because Cooper mildly defended Jackson presidency. Right? The Federalist Party was dead. The Whig Party replaced it beginning in 1834, right at this time when Cooper returns to the United States. You know? The Whig Party was the party of Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, but it's also, like the Republican Party today, had traitors, idiots, ideologues, and fools you know, you know, all over it. You know? Now, since Jackson as a Democrat, had brought the party system to one that was extremely partisan and confrontational, the Whig parties and the Whig party press followed suit. Right? So both of the, you know, the, both political tendencies in the country at the time you know, were irrational, lying pieces of crap in most of the newspapers, most of the time about most everything and most everyone. Now, in a letter to his countrymen, published in 1834, I mentioned it earlier, 
Cooper made clear that he was not a party man, writing, well, I wish it to be understood that this letter is written without the slightest view to party, for I shall never voluntarily lower myself from the condition of a free man to become the mere political partisan of any man. <coughs> You know, and in that book, he mildly defends Jackson, you know, which actually, I think the way you should look at it is, like Democrats today that hate everything Obama's doing will still defend him against the idiocy you know, that dominates the Republican Party. Right? You know, so I think you have to look at Cooper in that, in that way. You know, so there's other references that Cooper makes in articles, in letters, and most of the defense Cooper makes of Jackson is really formalistic, technical arguments on constitutional this or that. You know? He really, in just a few, only in a few cases, actually defends the policy of Jackson. The shutting down of the National Bank, the shutting down of internal improvements, infrastructure building, you know, the the genocide against the Cherokees. You know, Cooper, in many two cases, has even mentioned these things. You know, in his infrequent and mild uh, references in support of Jackson. You know, so the uh, now Cooper does say internal improvements, infrastructure building by the federal government is unconstitutional. Now, why does he do that? His father's friend was Hamilton. You know, his lawyer was Hamilton. John Quincy Adams demonstrated in his presidential administration how the building of infrastructure builds the nation. You know? Well, I think you know, my assessment at this point is that Cooper was relatively ignorant of principles of physical economy and of the American system itself. Now, you remember a lot of other things. Right? You know, Matthew Carey, who published The Olive Branch, which we saw a long time ago, you know, and Henry Carey, his son, was the lifelong publisher of James Fenimore Cooper. And it's Carey, both these Careys who are the, 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 you know, the epitome of the defense of the American system for more than 50 years, actually 70 years, the two of them. So, you know, so you've got all these seemingly contradictory things, but you know, one, one author says, well, the reason you like Jackson is because Jackson kicked the British ass at New Orleans in the, in the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, you know, whereas the Navy you know, had few and far between victories most of the time. So he appreciated Jackson for kicking the British ass because Cooper you know, never loses sight that the enemy is the British, the British Empire. So, anyway, so now a new irony develops. In the 1840s, Cooper wrote several novels attacking you know, a phenomenon that was going on, especially in New York State. That is, renters of you know, farms and, and, and land would seize the property from the big landlords. You know, these were land of the states that go back all the way, you know, 100, 200 years before when the Dutch were actually the dominant force in New York State, right? You know, so these huge uh, estates, and they rented out to settlers, and, and the settlers, in a real uprising, you know, very populist, you know, stupid populist, you know, certain justification for, the, you know, revolt against exploitation, but you know, it was unleashing lawlessness in the country. So Cooper writes several novels that are attacking this. At that point, the Whig press changes sides and start praising Cooper. You know, for 10 years before, they had been attacking him. So while the parties may have gone back and forth, <coughs> in their, from their standpoint in their relation with Cooper, Cooper, you know, stuck to his principles, and he continued to attack the consequences and the, and 
the actual functioning of a party system. In a letter, 1834, uh, after discussing some of the attacks against him, he wrote, we have a vast deal of party politics without, I firmly believe I say the truth, a single statesman in the whole country. I have not met a single man since my return who appears to me to have thoroughly examined the Constitution. Cooper's legacy. Cooper was a religious man and as one of the founders of the American Bible Society in 1816, he helped set in motion the missionary work that sent to peoples all over the world the best that America had to offer. Among the missionaries sponsored by the American Bible Society were the missionaries who went to Hawaii in the 19th century. And some of them became a decisive influence in educating and training Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the father of the Republic of China. So this is Cooper's legacy. During the 1840s, late 1840s especially, uh, we'll actually go back, 1839 Cooper published his masterful two-volume history of the Navy of the United States of America. Now this was published 170 years ago. It is still used today in Annapolis as a reference book. It was so thorough on the first you know, 40, 50 years of the US Navy's activity and, and history. Now later in the 1840s, as the British pushed forward their attempt to split the United States between North and South on slavery, Cooper and others of the Cincinnati Society Network began building a new Republican political movement in the country. The millions of German immigrants who had come to the United States since 1815 became one of the driving elements of this new movement. Many of them who came, came armed with the ideas they had learned from Cooper. This movement, which was to found the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln, in 1856, used the dying Whig Party in 1852 to run the general, to run General Winfield Scott for president, 1852. Scott, a member of the Society of the Cincinnati, the biggest hero of the War of 1812, 40 years earlier, and the commander of the U.S. Army for 30 years. During 1850-51, Cooper, General Scott, <coughs> and Cooper's old friend, Commander William Shubrick of the Navy, planned out Scott's campaign. Cooper's unfortunate death in 1851 put Scott's campaign in the hands of Cooper's enemies, ensuring that Scott lost the election, though it's not clear to me that, that the victory for Scott in that election was even possible. Yet Cooper's work in helping to build the new Republican movement in the United States resulted, eight years later, in the victory of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln created the British run, Lincoln crushed the British run insurrection of the Confederacy and launched the Industrial Revolution and ensured the survival of the United States Republic, which would continue, in the words of Lafayette, to be the temple of liberty and the beacon of hope for all mankind. Now we're going to conclude with a 
dramatic reading, which will take five minutes or so, from Cooper's The Heidemauer, to which I'll introduce, and then Eric and Jeremy will do the reading. Now, the Heidemauer, or the Benedictines, the title itself, the Heidemauer, means in German, Pagan's Camp or a Small Fortress. Right? And it refers to some old, <coughs> old Roman Empire ruins located near the town of Durkheim in Bavaria, Germany. Also nearby are the ruins of a Catholic abbey or monastery. Now, The Heidemauer is one of the three novels Cooper wrote on European themes and subjects. And like his Bravo, is aimed at an American audience. LaRouche wrote in 2003, 10 years ago, he said, the principal function of most of Cooper's published writings were composed in the conceptual form of classical drama for the purpose of informing Americans on how to look at foreign and domestic situations in which we confront our republic's enemies. Now, the novel set in the 1520s, right? And within a few days of the action of the story, uh, in which the story takes place, you know, a few scenes, a few characters, you know, it reflects in these just few days a century and a half of religious warfare, you know, 1511 to 1648, you know, including the Thirty Years' War, which Deborah discussed last week, you know, which had just erupted a few years before the scenes in this novel occurred. Okay. Now, a feudal lord, you know, a competitor for influence and power over the peasants of the area, with the Catholic or Benedictine monastery, you know, there's a conflict of these two powers, right? So the feudal lord takes advantage of the growing power of Luther's Reformation movement to settle scores with the local Catholic monastery. In Cooper's story, it's the Benedictine Abbey that gets the torch. Within a few days, institutions and customs centuries old disappear. Towns are set against towns. Families are divided by conflict over interest and faith. And individuals change dramatically, for the better and for the worse. Cooper's novel is a work of what LaRouche calls historical specificity, in which the state of society, in this case, its leaders and its masses alike are predominantly, effectively insane. Right? While Cooper's novel is not strictly a work of classical tragedy in the <coughs> Shakespeare sense, it is a tragedy which is portrayed. <coughs> Even the more decent characters while acting sometimes with great personal courage and against the brutishness and the evil, you know, they are all still oblivious to the processes of, historic, of history which are shaping the world around them and creating the circumstances which they're reacting to, and thus they're unable even to have an idea of changing those conditions. The following dialogue, which Eric and uh, Jeremy are going to present, is between a cowherd, you know, I put some definitions up here, you know, cowherd, one who herds cows. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
a cowherd named Gottlob and one of the Benedictine monks, Father Siegfried, Siegfried from the Abbey. The monk is probing that cowherd on the state of mind of the people in the village of Durkheim in regard to the dispute between the Abbey and Lord Emich, the Count of Hartenburg, on who's going to control the region and the peasants. Right? The immediate intention of the, of the monk is to recruit Gottlob as a spy, you know, knowing that Gottlob works for Lord Emich. Because the monks want to find out how many troops Emich has in his castle and what is the intention. So the monk begins the dialogue under the assumption that the cowherd is little more than an illiterate peasant. And he's attempting, essentially deceitfully, to find out some intelligence and to recruit him, uh, Gottlob, as a spy. So the, the two of them are walking together from a visit to a hermit's shack located somewhere near the Heidemount. And, the, Got, and the, the dialogue begins with Gottlob mentioning that he is from the village of Durkheim. And the monk then begins the dialogue. Gottlob, since your name is Durkenheim, can't say odds of the humor of its people in the matter of contention between our holy abbot and Emmick of Hartenburg. Were I to tell thy reverence the truth that lies deepest in my mind, it would be to say that the burghers wish to see the affair brought to an end in such a way as to leave no doubt hereafter to which party they owe most obedience and love since they find it a little hard upon their zeal to have so large demands of these services made by both parties. Thou canst not serve God and mammon, son. So saith one who could not deceive. And so saith reason, too, worshipful monk. But to give thee at once my inmost soul, I believe there is not a man in our Durkheim who believes himself strong enough in learning to say, in this strife of duties, which is God and which is man? How do they call in question our sacred mission, our divine embassy, in short, our being who we are? <laughs> no man is so bold to say that the monks of Limburg are what they are. That might be irreverent to the church and indecent of Father Siegfried. <laughs> and the most we dare to say is that they seem to be what they are. <laughs> and that is no small matter, considering the way things go in this world. Seem to be, Gottlob, said my poor father, and thou wilt escape envy and enemies. For in this seemliness, there is nothing so alarming to others. It is only when one is really the thing itself that men begin to find fault. If thou wishest to live peaceably with thy neighbors, push nothing beyond seeming to be. For that much all will bear, since all men can see. Whereas being, being oftentimes sets a whole village in an uproar, it is, a, it is wonderful the virtue there is in seeming, and heart burnings and scandal, ay, and the downright quarrels there are in being, just what one seems. No, the most we say in Durkheim is that the monks of Limburg seem to be men of God. And Lord Emmick. As to Count Emick, Father, we hold it wise to remember he is a great noble. The elector has not a bolder knight, nor the emperor a truer vassal. We say, therefore, he seems to be brave and loyal. <laughs> Thou makest a great account, son, of these apparent qualities. Knowing the frailty of man, Father, and the great likelihood of error, we wish to judge of acts and reasons that lie deeper than our knowledge. We hold it to be the most prudent. No, let us of Durkheim alone as men of caution. 
For a cowherd thou wantest not wit, <laughs> canst read. And by God's favor, Providence put that little accident in my way when a child, Reverend Monk, and I picked it up, and I'm, as I might swallow a sweet morsel. It is a gift more likely to injure than to serve one of thy calling. <laughs> the art can do little to benefit thy herd. I will not take upon myself to say that any of the cattle are much better for it. <laughs> Though to deal fairly by thee, Reverend Benedictine, there are animals among them that seem to be. How? Wilt thou attempt to show a fact not only improbable, but impossible? Go to, thou hast fallen upon the silly work of a jester. There have been numberless of these commissions of the devil poured forth since the discovery of our imprudent brother of Mainz. I would gladly hear in what manner a beast can profit by the art of printing. Thy patience, Father Siegfried, and thou shalt know. <laughs> now here is a hind that can read, and there is one that cannot. We will suppose both of them the servants of Emic of Hardenburg. Well, they go forth of a morning with their herds, this taking the path to the hills of the Count, and that, having read the description of the boundaries between his lord's land and that of the holy abbot of Limburg, taking another, because learning will not willingly follow ignorance. Whereupon the reader reaches a nearer and better pasture than he who hath gone about to feed upon ground that has only been trodden upon too often before by hoof of beast and foot of man. Thy learning hath not done much toward clearing thy head, Gottfried whatever it may have done for the condition of thy herd. If your worship has any doubts of my being what I say, here is proof of its justice, then. I know nothing that so crams a man and confuses him as learning. He who has but one horn can take it and go his way, whereas he that hath many may lose his herd while choosing between instruments that are better or worse. <laughs> he that hath but one sword will draw and slay his enemy, but he that hath much armor may lose his life while putting on his buckler or headpiece. I had not thought thee so skillful an answer, and thou thinkest the good people of Durkheim will stand neuter between the abbey and the count? Father, if thou wilt show me by which side they will be the greatest gainers. I think I might venture to say with some certainty on which side they will be likely to draw the sword. Our burghers are prudent townsmen, as I have said, and it is not often that they are found fighting against their own interests. <laughs> okay. It is getting a little late, but we can take a few questions or comments. Uh, so. I mentioned a few times the French newspapers were attacking Cooper. You know, they, the, the newspaper of France and Germany dominated the continent at the time. You know, and the American newspapers were a mixed bag, you know, partisan. Some of them, you know, one figure I saw said that something like 40% of the newspapers in the United States were owned by British citizens. So you get a sense of it, but but the it is mainly the British press or those in France who are kowtowing to the to the British that are attacking Cooper. Except there are certain uh, special interests within within France around the monarchy and the oligarchical structures in France that obviously was responding also. I know it's pretty thorough, so we probably exhausted all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> but Cooper wasn't killed. He just died. Of no, he, you know, he he 
was, he did not meet the fate of Alexander Hamilton or Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, and he had a lot, he had a lot of friends in the Navy, yeah. high up in the Navy, and also the Army, like you know, uh, Winfield Scott. You know, there, there was, like Lyndon Roosh describes today, right, General Dempsey and others with the intelligence in the intelligence and military community, right? They act and rise above interest of party. Right? They're acting from the standpoint of the national interest. That's what Cooper was acting from. That's what General Scott, you know, Commander Schubert, and others were acting from. Right? And you know, so maybe he had some protection, or you know, remember, you know, assassinations did not occur very often in the 19th century of you know, Hamilton, Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley. Right? Once every 25 years, it's equivalent, and that's it. Right? It was not a dangerous thing. You know, presidents just went shopping at 7-Eleven or wherever they, were. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wherever they wanted to do, any time. The White House was wide open. People would just walk yeah. in, you know, and they did. So, Wasn't it likely that his father was killed? Well, there's a Cooper family tradition that says William Cooper was murdered, hit on the back of the head as he left a political meeting in Albany, New York. Right? Now, there's, a, there's a, several problems with this story. It was never told until 1890s, right? You know, 90 years after the supposed murder. It was never, it was never, there was never reported in any newspaper of the time that Cooper had been assaulted and died, right? Even though two years before, he'd been assaulted, you know, at a political meeting, and he'd injured seriously, and it was reported all over the place, and there was lawsuits, and the guy arrested and everything else. <coughs> but if he was murdered in 1809, you would think that he, sh you know, there would have been some mention in some newspaper in the country, you know, in that period. And there's nothing. So the uh, articles and stories I've read on it, you know, you know conclude that you know it's a family traditional story that has no foundation in fact. That he, that he died of pneumonia or something else over a period of December 1808 into January, early February 1809. He was dying over a two month period, something like that. So. I know Tony Chaikin has that in his book, Trees in America, and I have it in my original article uh, written 24 years ago uh, and republished in 2007 in EIR and on the website. But, uh, so I've taken that out because I, I don't see any evidence that that's true then. There's a lot of other uh, interesting areas, uh, Cooper and slavery. I would just to summarize it. You know, Cooper, you know, really was one mind with Lincoln. You know, I mean, Lincoln is uh, twenty years younger than Cooper, approximately. <coughs> but they're they're of the same mind on the issue of slavery. Both of them in the eighteen twenties, you know, are making attacks on slavery, right? you know, uh, and both of them have the view that it's constitutional. There's nothing the U.S. Congress can do about it. It's a state issue, but it will fade away. It cannot survive. The progress of the nation, the development of technology, the, 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 the progress of the nation as a whole, mentally, you know, slavery will hopefully fade away more quickly than, than, than not. You know, that was Lincoln, that was Cooper, all through the 1820s, 30s, into the 40s is only when the slave power began losing its capability of essentially controlling the country in the late 1840s, early 1850s, 
because more and more states were coming into the Union, and they were free states. And so slave power was losing its power in the 1820s. I mean, the late 1840s, early 1850s. And at that point, Cooper and then Lincoln become alarmed. And Cooper never loses focus on what's behind it is the British Empire. He never loses that. Lincoln really doesn't identify it that sharply. But Cooper, by 1850-51, is not convinced that the nation will not break up over slavery. He's very becoming more and more concerned along those lines, which is exactly what happened with Lincoln with the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. As Lincoln said, that did it. That aroused me. You know, I'm going to fight this expansion of slavery. And so Cooper was dead for three years by then. But, but both of them really had the same, you know, virtually the same outlook and followed the same pathway on the issue of slavery. So how do you apply all of this to what's going on right now in Detroit and Wall Street and all these teachings that the way that he was uh, explaining what was going on? Well, in two ways. One, unless we pull the American people out of their stupidity, <laughs> out of their cowardice, right, out of their askissing, you know, unless we pull American people out of that type of mental state that most of them are in, right? you know, we're not going to beat the damn bastards. You know? So that's one thing. And that, in the history lesson tonight, is you know, a great American who did that in his time that we should be doing in our time. And this is why LaRouche always stresses you know, the issue of classical culture, the upliftment of the mind, the promotion of the creative power of the, of the human mind as what distinguishes us from animals. Right? So that's one side. Second you know, is you know, Cooper's identification of the British Empire as the source of all evil that was hitting the country over the period from 1790 until he died in 1851, 60 years. Well, you know, we lost that, that knowledge. We can get it back. You know? It's the British Empire behind 9-11. It's the British Empire you know, and its satrapy called Wall Street that steals and loots the world. Mm -hmm. So I think those two points and then, you know, so what do you do? You know, do the same thing Cooper did. You know, ridicule you know, their enemies, make people laugh at them, and never back down from a fight with them. Okay, so. you, you did better than my question was going to Bravo. <laughs> Saturday, I don't know what we're doing. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Eric does or somebody, but I don't know. But there will be something there. 7.30 again next Saturday. Thank you.